Well, somebody in the house say amen. Amen, Amen, Amber. God bless you, Jaquita Logan. Man, 11th hour, you guys just knocked it out of the park. God bless. Yeah, I love that song. Take me to the key. It's really, you know, it's odd we didn't talk about this, how the Holy Spirit works sometimes. It's really, really, in some ways, what I really want to speak about tonight. But I just, I must say how much I love 11th hour. They've been to my church several times. Uh, love them dearly. And uh, they are always a great blessing. I love the variety in their worship. And I tell you what I love about them. You can find anybody who's talented and can sing. But it's different when you sing from the heart. You're living it out. You know, you, you, God's worked in your life first. I tell my folks, I can't give away what I don't have. I can't lead you to a place I haven't been. And so I'm grateful for you guys. God bless you. And um, thank you for being here. When I heard that you guys were going to be here, I was excited. I said, that's great, a reunion for us. So thank you so much. I'm always honored to be with you guys. And Fred, where are you? Is Fred around here? He, God bless you, brother. Man, I'm telling you, the worship tonight at choir... Your orchestra, man, I, you know, if we could just get Brother Fred to have a little energy, a little, a little passion about him, he's so laid back and lethargic, you know, it just bugs me, you know, and I love him, man, I'm telling you, he's become a dear brother and a dear friend to me, and I love you, great job, man, your worship, this worship ministry pastor was just phenomenal, if it hadn't scared you, I'd have ran a lap, amen, I'm telling you, it's incredible stuff tonight. And I'm honored to be here, Dr. Chaddock. Thank you so much, Pastor, for inviting me. Um, you know, um, I looked at all the preachers you had before. I thought, oh, I just don't want to mess this thing up. But I'm telling you, uh, it's an honor for me to be here. And I know as a pastor, you don't open your pulpit up lightly. So thank you for trusting me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said to him privately, and I say to you publicly, I'm under his authority tonight. If I say anything he disagrees with, you go with him. He's the pastor. And then God will straighten him out later. Amen. So, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. But I'm going to tell you. This dear brother, he, God did a great thing when he brought our hearts together a few years ago. And he has become just a dear, one of my closest friends, a dear, dear brother. And I love you. And I'm thankful. And I'm telling you, God did a great thing when he brought him to Mims Baptist 14 months ago. Amen. Yeah. Awesome, man. And when he shared me, he said, hey, I think God's calling me to Texas. I said, are you sure? Do you need to pray about that again? And he said... No, I tell you, I, this church, Mims, I did. Man, I was just an excited. What a just a marriage made in heaven, a match made in heaven, and so, I mean, I'm excited you're here, and uh, God is using you in a, in a marvelous way. What I believe is going to be a long ministry, and I'm just, I'm great. I love the history of this church, but I'm grateful God's brought you here for such a time as this. Now, I'll say this, and then I'm going to preach. If I talk fast, will y'all listen fast? Will that be okay? All right, so we'll, we'll do that. I, I do want to say this, and. Uh, I have the opportunity, and I, I humbly have the opportunity to rub shoulders with a lot of pastors and to be in other places. And um, sometimes when you get close to pastors, you get disappointed sometimes. And I'm grateful to rub shoulders with your pastor. And I want to say to you, he and his precious wife, his family, this dear brother is the real deal. And I love him dearly. And I'm going to tell you, he loves you. He's a shepherd. And God has called him here. And he feels that calling, the burden of that calling. And he loves you. And he's more excited about the future of men's than he ever has been, and I, you know, for your future. And so I just, I'm grateful to be here tonight. Uh, thank you again. Take me to the key. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 7, if you would, just a moment. Um, I, I, you know, you don't know this, but I've worshipped with you before. I was here in January, but I have... I have watched all three Monday night services because I didn't want to, I didn't know what I was going to walk into. And so, man, you guys have been in for a, you, you, God has just set in on the house, hasn't he? Amen. And I'm just excited to come along this last service and kind of fan your flame just a moment, if I may do that. Luke chapter seven, uh, I want to preach on the subject activating the presence of Jesus in your life. And I tell you what, I don't often do this, but here's what I want to do. I want to tell you what I want to ask you to do at the end of the service right now. I want to ask you to give everything you have to everything he is. And I don't know what that means. That's between you and God. The Holy Spirit will tell you. I, I don't know what that means. But every teenager, every mama, every daddy, every mamma, every papa, every single adult, every person in this worship center, I'm going to ask you to give everything you have 
to everything he is. That's when revival happens. That's when an awakening happens. And if there was ever a time that we needed a movement of God, I'm not talking about revival service. We've been in services we called awakening, kind of like what you're doing. We do them on Wednesday nights. And I told my folks, hey, we had our last awakening service, but awakening is not a service. It's a movement of God. And that's what revival is. It's a movement. And I don't know about you, but I want to get on the movement because if there's ever a time we needed a movement of God in our nation, it is now, right? I, I don't want to be alarmist, but I do want to be a real us, our nation's in trouble. We're, we're in a real mess. And I want to tell you, the, the president is not the answer. The 2020 election's not the answer. It doesn't matter. Who, I tell my folks, listen, you ought to be involved politically. You ought to vote your Christian values, vote your Christian principles, but do not look to Washington, D.C. to solve America's problems. The only hope we have is Jesus, my friend. I will lift my eyes onto the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. The only one who can straighten out the mess we're in is God Almighty himself. And so judgment begins at the house of God with me and with you. We got to get right with God. Amen. So the church needs to get right with God. Well, you know, you are the church. I am the church. We are the church. Look at your neighbor. Help me pray. It goes a lot quicker. Look at your neighbor and tell them you are the church. Yeah. And we're in a mess, aren't we? We're in trouble. I think about this couple. I, maybe I share with you. Their marriage was in trouble. And so the wife finally convinced the husband to go get counseling. You know what, guys? We don't want to go sit down with a counselor and air our dirty laundry. So she was just, finally she convinced him to go. They sit down with this marriage counselor. And the wife begins to unload to the counselor about all of her problems. Oh, my husband, he never helps around the house. Man, he never washes the clothes. He never washes the dishes. He never vacuums the floor. He don't even mow the yard. He doesn't do anything around. Doesn't even take out the trash. And man, the counselor had all he could take. He stood that wife up. He leaned her back and he gave her the kiss of her life. He stood her back up, her eyes big as silver dollars, smile as big as the moon. He looked to the husband, the counselor did, and said to the husband, the husband, that's what your wife needs. And he said, is that all I can bring her by every Tuesday and Thursday? <laughs> well, <laughs> we're in trouble. Uh, so we, we, need a, we need a movement of God. Can I get an amen in the house? So what does that look like? Let me take a very familiar passage of scripture briefly. Watch this. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew, when she heard, when she learned that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, a bottle of perfume. And she stood at the feet of Jesus behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and she anointed them with fragrant oil. Let's stop there just a moment. How do we act? the presence of Jesus in our lives, in our homes, in our churches, in our communities. How do we do that? First of all, you've got to get desperate. Mm. You've got to get desperate. This woman was very desperate for a move of God, a move of Jesus in her life. And you say, well, how do we know she was desperate? Let me, let me give you two simple ways we know. Number one, she was not invited to the dinner, but she showed up anyhow. Did you notice that? Look at verse 36 again. It's very clear. It's very bold. The Bible says clearly the Pharisee invited Jesus to his house, and yet this woman shows up. I love the, her audacity, Pastor. I love her boldness. Uh, most scholars would tell us that she was a prostitute, so she had no peace in her life. She had no joy in her life. She knew her life was not where it ought to be. She knew it was not where God wanted to be. It wasn't even where she wanted it to be. And she hears Jesus is in town. And she thinks, man, I've heard about this Jesus. I, I, I've heard this Jesus can, can feed the hungry. I've heard that this Jesus can touch blind eyes and they can see, man. I've heard this Jesus has touched lame limbs and all of a sudden they can walk. I've heard Jesus can raise somebody from the dead. I just wonder if he could do that for them. Maybe he could do that for me. So her life is messed up and she decides, I've got to go over there and see Jesus. Now wait just a second. You could hear her talking to her girlfriends, maybe at the salon or in the community, right? And she says to her girlfriends, hey girls, you'll never guess where I'm going tonight. Where are you going? I'm going to the Pharisee's house. Really? Yeah. Well, I didn't even know you knew the Pharisee. I don't. You don't know him? No. 
but you're going to his house. That's right. Did he invite you? No. He didn't invite you? No, but you're going to his house. That's right. And they might say back to her, well, you can't really do that. You don't show up in somebody. He hadn't called you. He hadn't texted you. He hadn't RSVP'd you. He hadn't Facebook messengered you. You know, whatever. He, no, no, he hadn't done any of that. And they would say to her, well, you can't show up at somebody's house uninvited. You could almost see her stand back and say, girls, you better watch me because I heard Jesus is in town. And man, I have got to get to Jesus because my life is messed up. My life is a wreck. I have no peace. I have no joy. Man, I have no satisfaction. I got to get to Jesus. And listen to me, man. She shows up uninvited. That's courage, isn't it? That is boldness. I love her audaciousness. Where, can I just ask you as I ask my own church, I don't come here as an expert. Man, our church has got issues. We don't have it all figured out either. One thing I see lacking in the churches is, is boldness of desperation. Where is that in our churches? We just kind of show up and we sing our songs and we preach our sermons and we shake our hands and we eat our donuts and drink our coffee and, and we go home and say, see you next week. And we wonder why this nation's in the mess. We wonder why our churches are struggling because there's no desperation. God, I'm hungry for you. God, I'm thirsty for you. God, if you don't show up, we're in a mess. We're not leaving till you show up. Where is that desperation in our churches? Boy, she was desperate. She just boldly walks into a place she wasn't even invited. By the way, can you just imagine from the Pharisee's perspective what's happening? The Bible says he's reclining at the table with Jesus. You, you know, quickly, in, briefly in those days, they didn't have the tables and chairs, dining room table, like we had. They, they would have kind of a, a low-level table and they had no chairs. They would, they would lean on a cushion, typically on one elbow or the other. I always like to watch them work this out. They lean on one elbow. Or the other. Yeah, I love that. Anyway, very good. I love that. Yeah. And so here, here, here the Bible says, and I'm not exaggerating, read it for yourself. The Pharisee is reclining at the table with Jesus. He's sitting across the table from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I don't want to be sacrilegious. He's eating chips and salsa with Jesus. Are you getting this? This is crazy. You can just imagine him telling his fellows at work, you'll never guess who's coming to my house. Who? Jesus. Get out of here. No, no, he really is. You talking about the Messiah? Yeah, yeah, he's coming to my house. You have got to be kidding me. No, 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 we're going to take a selfie. I guarantee he is coming to our house. And so he's sitting across the table from the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, I mean, this is, I'm not exactly, he's reclining at the table with Jesus. All of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. He's probably thinking of all nights for the Mormons to show up. You've got to be kidding me. Are you serious? Are they over here on their bicycles? You've got to be kidding me. Right? I mean, what an interruption, right? All of a sudden, the, and listen to me. He begins to walk to the door. Don't miss this now. And in barges this uninvited woman. Why? She was desperate. Are you desperate? The only thing worse than being in a crisis is being in a crisis and not know you're in a crisis. And that's where many of us are. I want to tell you, with that Jesus, you're in a crisis. My church, we need Jesus. Mims, you need Jesus. Where is that desperation? The book of Isaiah says he'll pour water on him that's thirsty. Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are they who are hunger, who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? They will be filled. My pastor's in heaven now, uh, but he would say to me as a young preacher boy, he would say, Kevin, you know, you have all of God you really want. That's right. Wow. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, she was desperate. She wasn't invited, but she showed up. You know, I, I don't have this all figured out, but I have discovered, I was saved when I was eight years old. I surrendered ministry when I was 11 years old. 
And I've learned something in a few years of ministry. God shows up where a people are hungry for him to show up. If not, you'll just have church. You, you can have a good time. You can sing great music. <laughs> you can have some interesting messages. You can, you can have wonderful fellowship. You can shake hands and eat. Down. But, but if God doesn't show up, we're wasting our time. You, you, she was desperate because she wasn't invited to dinner. Let me give you briefly a, a second reason she was desperate. Notice how the Bible describes her. Uh, a woman, we never get her name, by the way. Never get a, her name, just a description. And what is the description? Uh, she's from the city, and, it, and then watch this. And she is what? A, a sinner. <laughs> wow, that's a pretty bold explanation. It, oh, when a, when a woman from the city who was a sinner heard that Jesus in town, then she went, the interesting description. She was a sinner. And so here's the deal. Her life's messed up, but she's not going to let that keep her from getting to Jesus. She was so desperate. She wasn't concerned that Jesus might condemn her. She was, she was more concerned that Jesus might heal her, might deliver her, might forgive her. She wasn't going to let her sin keep her from getting to the Savior. Interesting description of her. Think about this. When we describe someone, we often will use some kind of feature about them. For example, we might say, hey, uh, you know this woman I'm talking about. She, she works down at the grocery store. She's one of the checkout clerks. He might say, oh yeah, I've been down her aisle before. I know what you're talking about. Or we might describe, a, 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 we might say it this way. You know, you know, she's kind of a tall, slender, brunette hair. Oh yeah, I, I, I ran into her the other day. I know exactly who you're talking about. Or we might say, uh, you, you know the lady I'm talking about. She lives over on Pinehurst. Uh, she's on the, she's that corner house, white house, white picket fence. Got the big old tree in, in the side yard. Oh, I've driven by there many times. I've seen her out in the yard. I know exactly who you're talking about, right? Or we might say something like this. If you grew up in the country, we'd say sometimes we would describe a, you know her, she's old man Smith's daughter, right? And we'd say, oh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Oh, it's your, but that's not how the Bible describes her. The Bible says a woman who was a sinner. I wonder why the Bible described her that way. I, I don't know I have the full answer, but I would suggest this because I think God is trying to send the church a message that, that, that listen, that, that church was never designed to be a museum for saints, always a hospital for sinners. And so here's this Jesus, this Messiah, this Lamb of God, who's having dinner with the Pharisee, and in barges this woman. She's uninvited, and we don't even get her name, just a description. The Bible says, oh, and by the way, she's messed up. She's been marred by sin. She, she's, she's been marked by sin. She's got a sin problem, but she wasn't going to let that keep her from... In fact, it was the very thing that drove her to Jesus. And sometimes I think we've lost that ingredient in our churches sometimes. The enemy makes folks think, well, you can't go down there to Mims. You've got to have it all together. You, you know, you've got to get all your issues. In fact, many times church folk don't say this, but we think this. Sometimes we might even say it. Hey, we'd love for you to come to church, but you need to get your act together first. You know, you got, you got a lot of baggage. You got a lot of issues. Come, come on, get, get, get some things together. And then we'd love to have you, sure, but, but don't come strolling in there in, with your sin and all your baggage and all your issues. But could I just remind you folks, we all have issues. Everybody here has baggage. Nobody here has a right. In fact, I'll tell my folks sometimes on Sunday, hey, if you don't have any sin, you don't have any issues, don't join our church, we'll mess you up. Because <laughs> we got some issues, right? We're, we're messed up. Some of us just clean up better than us. Look at your neighbor tonight. Help me preach. Look at him. Say it with a smile. Tell him you got issues. Come on. Amen? Yeah. You got issues? That's right. I, I love when I do that. Sometimes I'll, I'll see these precious elderly couples been married 30, 40, 50 years, and, and the husband real boldly will look over and start to say, now, I ain't telling her that, preacher. I got to uh -uh, I, I go home with her. I can't, uh-uh, uh-uh, I can't do that. Can't do that. Yeah. Hey, it's true, isn't it? I mean, we have, we have sin problems, but it doesn't keep us from Jesus. And, I, you know, I, I, my wife and I, just take your mask off for a moment tonight. Let's just be honest. All of us here have issues. That's what Jesus, that's what the gospel's all about. Amen. <laughs> I mean, my wife and I, we, we, listen, when our kids, we have three daughters, uh, they're 27, 24, and 16 going on 30. <laughs> Come on, some of you remember those days? I remember when they were young. So, listen, some of our best arguments happened on the way to church. 
the time when we were supposed to be the most spiritual, we were the most fleshly. I, I can remember I would get up, man, I, I'd shave and I'd get dressed. I'm the pastor. I go out in the garage, you know, and I, I'm studying my message on patience, honking the horn. Hurry up. Come on. Come on. We got to get to church. Come on, honey. We got to get to church. What is taking them? The, about an hour later, she's been trying to get all three of those girls ready. She come dragging out with those three girls, right? And they'd all jump in the back seat. She'd get one leg in. I'd take off dragging the other and down the street. Come on, girl. I got to get to church. I'm the preacher. And all three of those girls, they'd sit in the back seat, man, when they're young, and they'd start fussing and fighting all the way to the church, just arguing the whole way. Little kids, she looking at me. She's sitting on my side, Daddy. She's breathing my air. Yeah, she couldn't, she couldn't, she's touching. She couldn't say staring. She's tearing at me. She's staring at me. She's touching me. Man, I'm telling you, I turn around and say, I'm going to touch somebody. We're going to church and I get spiritual. I'd pull in that church parking lot. We've been fighting the whole way to church. Open that door. Good morning, brother. How you doing? <laughs> we'll finish this later. <laughs> Why you laugh? Because you've been there, right? I saw some of you in the parking lot tonight. Amen. Hey. I just love the fact that she would not let her sin keep her from getting to Jesus. That's what the enemy does. The enemy says, no, clean yourself up. You can't clean yourself up, and neither can I. It won't last. That's reformation. It won't work. We need transformation. Transform from the inside out and only the power of God and the blood of Jesus. And by the way, here's the good news. It doesn't matter. You say, preacher, I've sunk too far. I've drifted. You don't know what I've been in. You don't know my issues. I'm here to tell you the blood of Jesus Christ is deep enough and wide enough and strong enough to forgive you of your sin. He can set you free. And when you're free, you're free indeed. And listen. And what a joy it is that you can walk in here, maybe overwhelmed with, with guilt, condemnation, shame. Man, I shouldn't even be here. I wish I hadn't come. Listen, tonight the blood of Jesus can wash over you and you can walk out of this place clean, set free, never to be remembered against you again. It's an incredible thought that you can be that clean. Yes. There's nothing like that feeling that I'm clean, not just on the outside, but on the inside. It's incredible. You, you, ever, you ever been hot and sweaty on the outside? Has it, has, it, has it been hot here in Texas like in Birmingham? I'm telling you, for the last month, I've just preached on hell every Sunday, man. I just, you know, we got people getting saved left and right. I said, you think this is hot? Mm-mm. Right? And you, you know, you're outside working in the yard, landscaping, mowing, whatever you're doing. You're, you're, you're sweaty. You're, you know, you're smelly. You're just, you feel awful. And, and you get inside, right? And you, t you take a bath, take a shower, right? And you put on some relaxing clothes, you know, your best relaxing clothes, whatever, you know, just, you know, some sweatpants and an oversized t-shirt. You know what I'm saying? You get comfortable and you sit down in your recliner. You got a big tea sitting there so big you can drink it or swim in it, you know, either one. And, and you sit back, got your remote in one hand, got your tea in the other, whatever, and you, you say, oh, you got clean on the outside. You said, oh, this feels so good. Let me tell you something that pales in comparison to being clean on the inside. Amen. Washed clean by the blood of Jesus. She was desperate. You got to get desperate. Number two, I've only got three. Are you okay? All right. Number two, you got to ignore the criticism. We're talking about activating the presence of Jesus. You got to get desperate. Then you got to ignore the criticism. Now watch what happens in our story. Oh, this is good. Let me be quick. Watch this. Luke chapter seven, verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, all right, what did he see? What's this referring to? Somebody help me. Come on. What did he see? Yeah, he saw the woman at the feet of Jesus and his feet is wet with her tears and her perfume and she's wiping his feet with her hair. When the Pharisee saw this, the Bible says he said to himself, oh, isn't this a holy moment? This is so amazing. I can't believe this would happen in my house. God, I'm so humbled. By this is phenomenal. Wait till the fellas down at work hear about this. Honey, you got to get in here and see this. Look at this woman who's been trapped by sin. Look at her at the feet of Jesus. Oh, what? No, no, he didn't say any of that. When he saw this, he said to himself, well, this man, 
if he were a true prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. By the way, Jesus knew exactly who she was. And by the way, he wasn't there for the Pharisee. He was there for her. Here's the Pharisee. He missed the moment. By the way, could I just remind you briefly? The Pharisee is somebody very religious. In our day and age, this person would be very active in our church. We're not talking about somebody outside the church. We're talking about somebody inside the church. I mean, a Pharisee today would, man, a Pharisee would be singing in a choir, maybe, maybe singing on your praise team. A Pharisee would be giving out the worship guides, a greeter, an usher, you know, might be teaching a Sunday school class, might, might even be on staff. We're not talking about somebody outside the church. We're talking about somebody inside the church. And instead of celebrating, he's too busy critiquing and criticizing, and he misses the moment. Moment. He misses the miracle of the moment. How many people are in church and miss God's movement because they're too busy keeping score? You miss the moment. Well, we ain't never done it that way before. <laughs> He's a big God. Don't put him in a small box. Well, nobody asked me to sing. That's because you can't sing. <laughs> Hear my heart today. How do two people walk out of the same service and one walk out and say, man, wasn't God in the house? <laughs> man, that worship, whoo, I almost had to take me a nitroglycerin tablet. Man, it was incredible. You could feel the power of God. And man, folks at the altar, and man, it was just and the worship and the fellowship. Man, it was just, I can't, I, I, I didn't want it to end. I mean, it was a fun. And somebody else walked in and said, man, I didn't like that service at all. Nobody shook my hand. The choir sounded like sick cows. The preacher must have golfed all week. How do you explain that? Somebody's critiquing and somebody came hungry and thirsty for God. It, this is so interesting. This woman never responds to the Pharisee. Why? She's too busy worshiping. I mean, she's at the feet of Jesus. She ain't worried about this dude. By the way, could I show you something scary? Could I show you something that's kind of frightening? Um, verse 39 says, the Pharisee spoke to himself. Verse 40, Jesus answers him. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Some of you backslidden church members, watch out. Well, I didn't say it out loud. Uh, he created you. He designed you. He knows every thought and intent of your heart. Can I get an amen? amen. I love that. He says to himself, and Jesus answered. Don't you know that shocked the daylights out of him, right? The fair, listen, this woman never responds. Why? She, she's too busy worshiping. At some point, if you really want to activate the power of Jesus in your life and in your heart and in your home, you can't worry about the naysayers on the sideline. I, listen, you get fired up from God, and I'll tell you what will happen. Somebody from the cold water committee will show up at your house. We don't do that here. Why? People are sleeping. That's why I'd be quiet. Oh, God, forgive us. In fact, in fact, Pastor, you know this is true. I've said, you're great. you get on fire for God, your greatest critics will come from inside the church, not outside the church. Outside the church, I mean, they don't know. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't get it. Why would you go to church on a Monday night? Are you nuts? Have you lost your mind? You work today and you're going to church. It's Monday. Are you crazy? Well, of course, they don't get it. I, I can laugh at that. They don't understand the Holy Spirit. They don't understand worship. They don't understand how the Word grows us, how we love it. They don't get it. I tell you what, I was trying, it's folks who ought to be celebrating with you on the inside, folks that ought to be cheering you on, folks that ought to be fanning your flame. They're the ones who are criticizing and critiquing you, making sure you don't get too far out of control. I tell my folks, be careful about criticizing somebody's worship. You weren't there when their life was falling apart and God showed up in their midnight hour and did something in their life that only he could do. You, you, 
You, you wasn't there when that single mom opened the refrigerator, didn't have any food, didn't know how she's going to feed her kids, and God somehow, some way, miraculously provided for her in her time of need. You wasn't there when they got the eviction notice and didn't know where they were going to live. You wasn't there when the spouse walked in and said, I don't love you anymore. I found somebody else, and her whole world was crumbling, and God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You weren't there when they didn't have their job and didn't know how they are going to pay the bills and finances were such a strain, and God just miraculously provided. You wasn't there when their world was turned upside down and God in that midnight hour ushered into that room his guardian angel's goodness and mercy and said you're my son you're my daughter I'll make a way where there seems to be no way you can do all things through Christ which strengthens me I'll take what the enemy meant for harm and I'll use it for your good and for my glory you weren't there when God if they get a little excited in worship excuse them maybe you could use a dose yourself amen Ignore the, listen, I'm telling you, the older you get, the more you ignore critics. I don't have time. I want you to join in. I'd love for you to come along. But if you're just going to stay on the sideline and critique and criticize, listen, I'm just going to brush it. I'm going to shake the dust off and move on. I don't have time to make you happy. Your spouse can't make you happy. You think I'm going to make you happy? Tickles me about church. Folks come in. Okay, they sit down, cross their arms, got their lipstick out as far as they can sit on and swing their legs. Okay, make me happy. Are you kidding me? That would be a move of God, wouldn't it? <laughs> Number three, and I close, ignore the criticism. Number three, worship with passion. You know, Pastor, I don't, I don't know how to fully explain this. I've watched it. I've seen it. I saw it tonight. The passion of worship opens the door for the presence and the power of Almighty God. We're not just singing songs. We're verbalizing our faith. We're announcing to the enemy, you've been defeated. We're telling the demons, you have no authority to be in this place. You're reminding yourself, I have victory in Jesus. I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. That's what worship does. And it opens up the windows of heaven and the power and the presence of God can fall on a place. It, it, it really is quite amazing. Our pastor said it earlier, he inhabits, lives in the praises of his people. Nobody should have to prime your pump. There ought to just be something on the inside of you that says, God has been too good for me not to give him everything I've got. You worship with passion. I, I say two things. Worship involves your emotions. This woman's at the feet of Jesus. She weeps, she cries, she kisses his feet. There is emotion when you're in the presence of Jesus. I know it's not all emotion. But what if we get too far out of control, preacher? What are we going to do then? Uh, we're not even on the radar yet. You can relax. We're not real close yet. We get close, we'll let you know. We're just working on smiling and breathing right now. It always tickles me, man. Worship does involve your emotions. Passion, energy. When your pastor invited me to come back, I couldn't wait. This is one of the highlights for me to come because I know there's going to be some energy and enthusiasm in this place. There's passion here. God shows up. Worship involves your emotions. There's joy, right, in the presence of Jesus, Psalm tells us. In fact, could I, could I give you, and, and, and I'm going to close, could I, could I give you, well, in just a minute or two, but could I give you... <laughs> Let me give you a verse that might just rock your world. Could I give it to you? It's not even in the notes. Acts 13.52. You brought your Bible. Look to Acts 13.52. If you got your, I, I, I tell my church, either open your Bible or turn it on. I know a lot of our young millennials, they turn their Bible on now. I get it. No problem. Acts 13.52. You see this? Acts 13.52. Simple verse. And the disciples were filled with Joy and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. I would submit to you, you cannot be full of the Holy Spirit and not be full of joy because joy is one of the ingredients, one of the characteristics of the fruit. Not fruits, it's one fruit, nine attributes. Galatians 5.22, love, joy. Love, joy. And I'm telling you, there's something about having joy in the presence of God. Where is the joy in most of our churches? Where is that? Somewhere along the line, we, we just kind of 
you know, grown accustomed to church being boring. Church is not boring. Worshiping God is not boring. It's what you were created to do. It's what you were designed to do. And I'm not talking about style of worship right now as much as I am passion of worship, authenticity in worship. I'm going to give him everything I have. You get out of worship what you invest in. Well, I didn't get anything out of that today. Well, it's because you slept through three-fourths of it. Yeah. <laughs> you get out of it what you invest in it. Where is the joy in most of our churches? Good night. We sing this incredible worship. 11th hour rocks the house, right? And you look out at God's people and you look like you've been baptized in prune juice. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you serious? Good night. Tell my folks, hey, I tell my folks, anybody had their sins forgiven? Yeah, preacher. I said, well, tell your face. Evidently, it ain't got the message. Good night. You think about people lost, been beaten up by the enemy. I mean, man, they're just, they're bleeding. They're discouraged. They're depressed. They're, 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 just, they're just overwhelmed. They're suicidal. We don't talk about it, but they're suicidal. And so they hear about this Mims Baptist and say, man, I'm telling you, I've heard some incredible stuff. I'm gonna, I know we don't like to use this language, but man, I'm, I'm going to give God a try. And they show up. If they could, they would crawl in. But it's too embarrassing, so they don't. But if they could, they would. That's where they're at. And what do they find in most of our churches? Dry, dull, dead religion. And they walk out saying, man, if that's all you got, I don't, I, I don't need that. Passion. My, my family and I vacation uh, at Panama City. My wife and my girls, we go down there every year. And uh, we, there was a little place down there called Pier Park. And it's kind of a place out to short, you know, shopping. You can walk around. And, and so we're down there walking around one night. And uh, we walk by this place called Tootsie's. I didn't go in, by the way, just for the record. I didn't go in. I didn't go in. Get that on tape, okay? It's a, kind of a country saloon. And they're, they're uh, doing uh, karaoke in there and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But we walk by and it's kind of quiet when we walk by. And as we get just in front of it in the sidewalk, my wife and I, my daughter's behind us, my wife and I, all of a sudden in the, in the tootsies, you, the windows are open and all that, it's summertime, they started playing Sweet Home Alabama. And when they played that song, when they spurt, that place went cuckoo. They went crazy. You know, that first song, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you older people, just Google Sweet Home Alabama, okay? It's all right. All right. And so, anyway, some movie will come up first, then go to the song. But anyway, and so, and so they, just, they just started going crazy. It was incredible. I mean, all of a sudden, the place erupted. I mean, I, it just, everyone jumped to their feet. It was, I saw empty wheelchairs rolling down the sidewalks. Man, I, I mean, crutches were flying out the window. I mean, the place went just like that. They went crazy. They just went nuts over that song. And we couldn't even hear ourselves talk. We walked on past that little place, and, I, and we got into a quiet spot. And Pastor, I said to my, and I don't mean to be cynical, but I'm, I'm a pastor. I've been in this a long time. I turned to my wife and my kids, and I said, you know, the, that was crazy, wasn't it? And they laughed, said, yeah, funny, and nuts. I said, you know, the sad truth of that is many, many of those same folk will be in church Sunday morning. And you get the least bit excited. You get, you, you get a shout in you, amen, hallelujah, praise God. You put your hands together. You lift your hands in worship. You get the least bit excited. And they will stare you down, down their long theological nose. We don't do that here. We only do that in Tootsies. <laughs> and listen to me. I, I, I'm, I'm almost done. I, I'm not arguing for crazy, you know, foaming at the mouth and growling like dog. I, I understand God's a God of order, and I, I get that. He's not order of He's not a God of chaos and confusion. But I'm telling you, when the people of God come to the house of God and we sing these incredible praises of God, and you hear the man of God preach the word of God, there ought to be something on the inside of you that says, "God be praised." We praise His name. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of your 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 praise. Hallelujah. 
right, sit down so I can finish. Give me a second. <laughs> and I'm a, you know, get in these environments. Sometimes, Pastor, you're, you've done, God's hand is in this place. And I'll call my wife tonight. That's what I do. I go home, go to the hotel room. And I say, she'll say, you know, you were excited about going there, yeah. And she'll say, how was it? I said, man, it was great. And her first question, she asked me this every day, you didn't go crazy, did you? <laughs> and I say back, it's their fault. I wouldn't have. They egged me on. <laughs> and I, you don't get to preach in these kind of environments very often, do you, Pastor? You know what it does to you. It, you, you, worship is about passion. The, the last thing I would say this is, uh, worship is about giving, not just getting. And somewhere along the line, we've kind of missed that. I don't know if it's too much warped Christian television that God was created just to make you happy. Are you kidding me? We were created for his good pleasure. Worship's not about me or you, it's about him. And worship really is about giving, not getting. In fact, when you think about this, this woman shows up in the presence of Jesus. And this, Brother Fred, listen, this rocks my world. She never asks Jesus for one thing. Is that amazing? I don't know if I would be there. I mean, if I'm going to see Jesus, I probably got a, I got a laundry list of things I'd like for him to kind of help me with. She doesn't do any of that. Why? She's broken at his feet. That's right. She's just humble to be in his presence. She didn't come there to get anything from him. She came there to give to him. That's the beautiful picture of worship. Yeah. Worship's not just about getting. Well, I'm going to go to church, see if I get something. No, no, no. I'm going to worship because I'm going to give him everything I have because he is worthy of everything I have. In fact, this woman gives two things and I'm finished. Number one, she gives her perfume. Think about that. In those days when you were going to visit someone of esteem, someone of great respect, you would always take a gift. So here she is. Use your imagination. She's le leaving her little one-bedroom apartment and she thinks, man, I'm going to see Jesus. I've got to take him. What am I going to give the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? And she notices that bottle on her, perf on her dresser. It's the only thing of value she has. It dawns on her. That's what I'll give him. It's the best she had. She grabs that bottle of perfume and she takes it to the feet of Jesus. By the way, here's a whole other sermon. The very thing the enemy was using to keep her handcuffed, it's the perfume that would first catch the attention of a man. The very thing the enemy was using to keep her handcuffed, she gave it to Jesus and he sets her free. And I don't know what has you handcuffed tonight. Maybe there's an addiction in your life you don't talk about. Maybe there's a grudge in your life that's ruining your life. Uh, maybe there's some unconfessed sin. Uh, uh, maybe there's a bitter root, uh, bitterness in your life. I don't know what it is. A jealousy. I'm telling you, you bring it to Jesus, he can set you free. Amen. She brings her perfume. Women love perfume. Again, I live with four women, my wife and three daughters. I think I've said here before, there's so much hairspray and perfume on a Sunday morning, I have to have an albuterol treatment to preach. <laughs> I've never seen so much perfume. And they love perfume. I remember my first church I pastored, it was a little small church, had a parsonage on one side, had a cemetery on the other. Sometimes there was more life in the cemetery than in the church, but that's another message. <laughs> And so I remember going over on Saturday because it was a little small church and I was the only staff member. So I went on Saturday to make sure everything was there and ready for Saturday. I walked in one Saturday and there must have been what I thought must have been a raccoon or a squirrel crawled up in the wall and died. I mean, something just, I mean, it just stunk in that church. I thought, what is that? And I followed to the little auditorium we had, the little worship center we had. And in the back of the worship center was an 88-year-old widow. I'll never forget it. Her name was Judale. And I looked at Judale and I said, Judale, do you smell that? And she said, yes. And I said, what is that? She said, it's my perfume. Do you like it? I said, I love it. <laughs> hey, I'm still in the ministry. I never forget this. My wife was here. She'd tell this truth. She shook her head like a teenager. She's 88 years old. And she said to me, preacher. Now she just, you know, there's about 10 rows. That's all that's in there. And she's standing at the back of there. And she said, preacher, they call it midnight passion. 
And she shook her head like a teenager. I just busted out laughing. And I just said to her without thinking, midnight passion. I said, well, Judeo, you go to bed at 8 o'clock. And then she said, I know, but if I'm ever up to midnight, preacher, I am ready. <laughs> it's the honest God's truth. My wife is here. She'd tell you that. Crazy. <laughs> She gives her perfume. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm almost finished. It's the very best she had. Question. Have you given him the very best you have? Most of the time we give him leftovers and then we wonder why he doesn't show up. If I have nothing better to do, I'll go to church. If it's not too hot, not too cold, if my team wins on Saturday, if I've run out of money, vacation money, well, okay, I guess we'll go to church now. No wonder God doesn't show up. Give him your best. And it's exhausting to do that. You're engaged. You're not just sitting there. You're engaged. You're participating. You're not watching. Tell my folks, we have a choir. I said, why do we hang on to a choir? Because we're not trying to entertain you. We're trying to engage you. We're helping you worship. It's not, well, they did good. No, no, no. Wow. My heart resonated with what they were singing. Lastly. I got a flight to catch tomorrow. I got to get this over with. Lastly, worship. Um, she gave her perfume and then she gave, you got to guess? What else did she give? Her tears. Man, that'll preach, but we ain't got enough time for that. That's a good one. That's not the one I'm looking at. Got another one? What else? She gave her kiss. That'll preach. That'll be another night. She gave everything. Yeah. She his feet with her hair. What's that? She his feet with her hair. Yeah. I had, it's always been in the text, Pastor, and I, it just didn't leap out at me. Maybe because I'm a man, I don't know. But a while back, God really res- just showed this to me. She gave her hair. Yeah. Now, to us guys, it doesn't mean a lot because if we don't have a lot of hair, we just get ready quicker. It's not a big deal to us. But to women, hair is vitally important. Again, I. I have four of them at my house. I never knew you could do so much to a lady's hair. Incredible. Color it and perm it and mousse it and gel it and primp it and tease it and layer it. And I walked in one day, my daughter was ironing her hair on the ironing board. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Hmm. I said, well, if you're going to do it, throw a shirt under it at least. Right here. I've got two or three shirts need iron in here. <laughs> she gave her hair. Now think about this. Um, I, I've, I know you've done this, Pastor. You're probably in this church tonight. There are some ladies in the battle for your life, cancer. And I've asked them, in my church, hey, help me be a better pastor. What's the worst thing about your journey? They're on the back side of it now. What was the worst thing? And they say, ah, I don't want to tell you. I don't know. Tell me. Help me. Help me be a better shepherd. How can I minister to ladies who are struggling with this? What was the worst thing? No, no, no. It seems so trivial. It seems, I, I, don't, I don't want to tell you. It's embarrassing. No, no, no. Please. You really want to know? Yeah. And then every one of them would say something like this. Well, everything tasted like battery acid. I couldn't sleep. I was always nauseated, sick in my stomach. I was always restless, dizzy. But that wasn't the worst thing. You know what the worst thing was, Pastor? The morning I got up and looked in the mirror and my hair was gone. And then they'll say, I'm ashamed to tell you, it devastated me. And I put my arm around each one of them, look them in the eye and I say, Sherry, you don't have to be embarrassed. That's the way God's made you. First Corinthians says a woman's hair is her glory. It's part of your DNA. It's the way you're made. Here's this woman giving her glory to the king of glory. And how does he respond? Hmm. 
Hmm. In those days, remember, they would have the water basin at the door. And someone would visit. They didn't have the concrete and the asphalt and the cars. They would travel by donkey or by foot, right? Sandals, dusty, dirty. They'd be in the house. And typically the lowest person in the house, little servant girl boy, would go and grab the water basin, remove their sandals, and say, we're honored you're in our house. They'd wash their feet and dry their feet. And so here's the scene. She's at the feet of Jesus. By the way, uh, we know she's kneeling. You say, why? Well, you can't dry someone's hair with your feet standing up. So she's at the feet of Jesus. And the little servant girl says, well, let me go get a towel. And she says, no, we don't need one. Well, yeah, we do this all the time. I just did this last week. It's right around the corner. I'll be right back. No, 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 no. Thank you, honey. We don't need a towel. Well, what are you going to do? And she leans over. And she takes her hair. And she begins to wipe the feet of Jesus. The Pharisee's still over there keeping score. He missed the whole moment. In fact, you go back and read it yourself. Jesus takes him to task. And she wipes the feet of Jesus. I believe her head is down because the tears are rolling off of her cheeks onto his feet as she's just broken and humbled to be in his presence. And then, as only Jesus can do, I believe, as the shepherd, he takes his hand, gingerly places it on her cheek, and raises her head. Why, Psalm 3, 3 says he's the lifter of our heads. And listen to me, for the first time in a long time, she's looking into the eyes of a man who wants nothing from her. And he says to her, I think the sweetest words in all the Bible, Look at verse 48. He says to her, your sins are forgiven. And her life was never the same. The same thing can happen to you tonight. Begin the message. I said, I'm going to ask you to do something. Give everything you are to everything that he is. Would you do that? I wonder if we might just play something. Somebody, a piano or hammer or whoever, somebody, yeah, it'd be great. Just play something for us. And our pastor and his staff are going to be right here. If you need to give your life to Jesus, could I just ask you, what are you waiting on? He created you. He loved you. He loves you like nobody loves you. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is to give your heart to Jesus. Maybe tonight that's your decision. Maybe you're here as a guest and you live in the area and say, we've been looking for a church home where, you know, God has led us here. Could I just ask you a question? What are you waiting on? Incredible worship and the man of God preaching the word of God, the fellowship. You can come tonight on this marvelous Monday. So, man, we, we, we're ready. We're, we're, we believe God has called us here. We're ready to roll up our sleeves in these last days. They'll be ready to receive you. But then for the rest of us, I wonder if you wouldn't be willing just to come, get on your knees all across this altar from the right to the left. If you're not physically able to kneel, you come and sit on these front pews. There's some seats wide open on these front pews. You just come and sit for a moment or two just to say, I'm not leaving here the same way I came. I'm giving you everything that I am. Because God, I need you. Our church needs you. Our community needs you. My home, my marriage, my kids, my grandkids, we need you. We're not leaving here the same way we came. You can come by yourself. You could come with your spouse. You could come with your family. You could come with some friends. I'm just begging you, please. This is not just a meeting to gather and sing some great songs and have great fellowship. We want God to show up. That's the heartbeat of your pastor and the heartbeat of this church and the heartbeat of your staff. I'm going to pray right now for you. Lord, I believe we preach the word you've asked us to preach. Now, Holy Spirit, we just get out of your way and ask you to do what only you can do. If they do it for me, if they do it for a pastor, if they do it for a person, it'll never last. But if they do it for you, it makes all the difference in the world. God, may we be desperate. May we ignore the criticism. May we worship you with all we've got tonight. 
Lord, you can change lives right here. You can save souls right here. You can put marriages back together. You can heal bodies. You can set the addicts free tonight. Lord, you can, you can heal a broken relationship tonight. You can, Lord, you can, you can free those who've been trapped by bitterness and anger. God, right now, this is your moment. In Jesus' name. Come on, with our heads bowed. This altar's open. Our pastor, our staff, they're right here to help you. Come on right now. I just want to ask you to just move. Just crawl over the person next to you if you need to. Just, just decide, I'm not leaving here the same way I came. I, I've got to get to Jesus. I, I can't worry about the crowd. There's too many people in my row. I, I can't worry about that. I, I, no one else is going with me. That's okay. I, I'm, I'm not leaving here the same way I came. We need a movement. We need a revival. Come on. You're in the balcony. Come on. Come on. Come on. From the right to the left, from the top to the bottom. Come on. Yes. 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 Come on. Yes. Yes. Come on. Could you stand and make it a little easier for folks to get out? Let's stand our feet. You can get out a little easier. Come on, this altar's right here. Come on. Our pastor, our staff's right here. Come on. Come on. Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Lord. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. Come on, young person. This is, come on, teenager. Come on, this is for you tonight. College student, this is for you tonight. Grandma, Grandpa, this is for you tonight. Church leader, this is for you tonight. Deacon, this is for you tonight. Come on. Come on.